Hi, I'm Tim. Please join me in this video as I talk about Frias and why you can't have a Fria in your backyard. Also, I'll talk a little bit about the intersection of Frias and controlled airspace and how they're really two separate discussions for RC modelers. Let's get to it. In this video, I'm going to go over having a FRIA or an FAA recognized identification area in your backyard. Right now, FRIAs are only authorized through community-based organizations, primarily the uh, Academy of Model Aeronautics. <clears throat> but several people viewing the channel goes, hey, look, I've got some private property. Why can't I just have a FRIA on my private property in my backyard and everything will be okay? So before we get started, I want to apologize for an earlier video. The microphone was just not all that good. I do have a brand new remote microphone, the HoloLand microphone. I'm going to try now just holding it in front of my mouth, talking a little bit slower and directly into the microphone. Let me know in the comments section if you can hear this audio okay. So the subject is remote ID. Everybody viewing this video should be generally aware of what remote ID is. The compliance date has been recently slipped to March 16th, 2024, so nobody has to comply with the remote ID until March 16th, 16th of next year. Part of the remote ID ruling that came out has the concept of a FRIA or an FAA recognized identification area. What happens in a FRIA when it's granted by the FAA, RC modelers flying at a FRIA do not need any remote ID equipment whatsoever. They don't need the standard remote ID installed in the factory. They don't need to do a module. They don't need anything if they're flying their recreational RC aircraft that weighs over 250 grams at the um, FRIA designated site with their local AMA club. Part 107 operators do need remote ID. This is for recreational flyers only. So some modelers have expressed the desire, well, geez, if we could have a FRIA at my club, why not just have one in my backyard? That way I don't have to worry about having remote ID modules. I'll comply with all the rules the FAA sets out and that would solve my problem. The problem is the FAA has denied this. I will have a written denial from them in the remote ID final ruling, but just I want to stand back a little bit to discuss the view from the FAA of what they're trying to do to implement remote ID. And so what I'd like to do is take uh, quotes from Department of Transportation Congressional uh, Testimony. This is in front of Congress over what's going on with remote ID. This is part of the 2018 FAA reauthorization bill. The FAA follows under the Department of Transportation, so this is a DOT response to Congress on what's going on with remote ID. The purpose of this, the remote ID is going to be a big deal, it's going to be a new regulation, and the Department of Transportation wants to make absolutely certain that the FAA is in lockstep with what Congress wants on the remote ID, because Congress is driving the whole issue behind remote ID. The, the FAA is simply implementing it. So DOT continues in the report to Congress stating that, quote, remote identification is fundamental to both safety and security of UAS operations. This is back in 2018. This is about five years ago. With remote identification, the FAA and our national security and public safety partners will be better able to identify a UAS and its operator, assess if the UAS is being operated in a clueless, careless, or criminal manner, and take appropriate action if necessary. Remote identification is the FAA's highest priority UAS-related rulemaking effort. So this goes along with what I've said all along, remote ID is here to stay. It's the very first step towards the ultimate goal of the commercial drone industry of fully integrated manned and unmanned operations in the national airspace system. Right now you can't do that because unmanned aircraft cannot see and avoid other aircraft. We have to segregate the two operations between manned and unmanned. Also, remote ID doesn't have anything to do with air traffic control purposes. What is happening is there are literally thousands of unmanned aircraft operating in the national airspace system. And the FAA wants to know who is operating these aircraft. The way to do this for the initial step, in their view, is remote ID. 
And the more exceptions you give to the requirement to have remote ID, by definition, you're going to lose track of operators. Just to take a wild example, let's say 50% of drone operators were exempt from remote ID. You just wouldn't be able to say with certainty who is flying in the national airspace system, which they've stated to Congress is something they want to do. Now, when the FAA did their notice to proposed rulemaking on remote ID, it was much, much different than the final ruling that is available today. The initial ruling required that all modelers had to log in to a national uh, tracking system, uh, their flights to be captured by a national database. There was going to be a user fee for using this uh, login service. And FRIAs were supposed to be lasting just one year because the vision of the FAA was after the one-year transition, everybody flying an unmanned aircraft civilians, we're not talking military or government operators, would have remote ID so that everybody had remote ID. That notice of proposed rulemaking received over 53,000 comments. I was one of them. And there were about 18 months of discussions with the AMA, AOPA, Experimental Aircraft Association, various stakeholders to try to come up with a more reasonable final ruling on the remote ID. Two things that came out of those discussions, the idea of logging into a national database went away. It was pointed out that in many sections of the country, you just can't get cell phone coverage. It was just a, a non-starter to include the fee. So that was a good thing. The other thing that came out of those discussions, which is a huge benefit to recreational flyers, is the concept of a FRIA, an FAA recognized identification area, went from just one year to now four years for community-based organizations. The AMA is one of those community-based organizations. There's about 2,500 AMA clubs. The free approval process now, um, this is October 3rd, 2023, probably about half the clubs have been approved with the extension of the remote ID compliance date to March 16th, 2024. Um, I am certain that the majority of those clubs will be considered. There's still some sticky points for denial FRIAs. That is being worked by the AMA and the FAA. But the important thing is the FRIAs are good for four years. And for recreational flyers, you don't do anything. You just fly as you have before with no equipment at your local RC field. Now, some viewers have said, well, gee, why don't you um, just give me a free in my backyard? I promise that I'll fly within it. I'll follow any rules by the FAA. It's uncontrolled airspace in my backyard and everything will be good. Now, there is, I'll discuss later in the video, there's no relationship whatsoever between the remote ID rules and controlled uncontrolled airspace. I'll get into that later. But there is a final ruling on the FAA and remote ID. It's 470 pages long. I think I'm one of the few RC models that have read the entire document front to back. It's really quite an interesting document because you can see through the document how the FAA received all of their 53,000 comments and how they responded to it with various inputs, requests, changes, modifications. So what I'd like to do is quote from page 182 to 183 of the remote ID final ruling on what the, what the FAA said about having a FRIA in, in your backyard. Comment. The New Hampshire Department of Transportation stated that anyone should be able to request an FAA-recognized identification area by certifying they are responsible for the area and will operate within FAA regulations. A large number of individual commentators believe that private individuals should be able to register their private property as an FAA-recognized identification area. Some commenters also asserted this restriction infringes on private property rights. The American Association of Airport Executives recommended that local governments should control the use of FAA-recognized identification areas through local laws and ordinances. The Experimental Aircraft Association suggested that if the FAA adopted a system like the FAA's web-based operation safety system to automate the application process, a community-based intermediary would not be necessary. So here's the FAA response. This is the final ruling. This is the FAA's decision. The FAA declines to extend eligibility to request FAA-recognized identification areas to any individual or individual property owner, regardless of affiliation. As discussed in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, the FAA intends most 
UASs to identify remotely, and others have remote ID standard or broadcast module. The operation of unmanned aircraft without remote identification equipment at FAA recognized identification areas is primarily for those who are truly unable to either use standard remote identification or a remote identification broadcast module. The benefits of requiring remote identification generally are undermined if the FAA recognized identification area eligibility criteria are expanded to a point where every backyard could be a potential site. Permitting private individuals to seek FAA-recognized identification areas would undermine the FAA's primary goal in establishing the remote identification requirements. So listen to this, the primary goal of remote ID. That is, enabling the identification of unmanned aircraft operating in the airspace of the United States by FAA, law enforcement, and other government officials. That goal cannot be met if every individual is able to operate without remote identification by requesting an FAA-recognized identification area. So there you have it. You can see the thinking behind that. The FAA wants basically everybody to have remote ID so they can identify who's flying where. Now, obviously, the FRIAs, and there's going to be well over 2,000 FRIAs granted. What about these models that don't have remote ID? There's basically a test going on. The FAA is going to see how the club members at these FRIA designated fields follow the rules. Do they stay within the FRIA airspace? Can they be entrusted to follow the regulations? Are they not going beyond it, which would violate the intent of the FRIA? I think this will work out okay. Every RC airplane club I've been in, the pilots keep visual sight of their models. They like doing touch and goes, traffic patterns, some aerobatics over the field. They're not out miles away exploring some area to take a picture, but we'll see. Right now, the free are good for four years. They can be exp um, uh, renewed after that time. Some viewers have suggested that the freers are going to go away. I have seen nothing in writing from the FAA on this. And I think what will happen is if the freers are being followed in good faith and they work for four years, it's just not going to be an incentive to take away this benefit because it doesn't really do any harm to the overall goal of tracking uh, aircraft through the national airspace system if people stick within their small FRIA, which I consider essentially the equivalent of a small restricted airspace. So let's discuss a little bit remote ID, controlled and uncontrolled airspace, because some viewers have reached out to me and say, hey, look, my backyard, I'm in uncontrolled airspace. I don't need remote ID. Controlled and uncontrolled airspace can get complicated. As a former flight instructor, I understand that because I, I had to teach it. But there are two separate discussions between controlled airspace and remote ID. Remote ID is designed in theory from the FAA that every um, non-government RC model, drone, plane, helicopter should have remote ID wherever they fly in the United States. The one exception to this is in the FRIA, the FAA recognized identification area, where they don't need um, any remote ID requirements. So what happens about controlled and uncontrolled airspace? Remember, when we fly our RC model aircrafts, we have to be flying in uncontrolled airspace. We cannot fly in any controlled airspace unless we have permission of that controlling agency. Most controlled airspace starts at either 700 feet above the ground or 1,200 feet above the ground. The exception when you're around uh, certain airfields with control towers, the controlled airspace comes down to the ground. The definition of controlled airspace per the FAA is airspace where the FAA is authorized to conduct air traffic, or air traffic management operations. In other words, if you have an instrument flight ruled aircraft or you're giving vectors, the FAA can only perform those actions in controlled airspace. There can be some advisors in controlled airspace, but there's very little controller act, um, activity in there because there's not that much uncontrolled airspace and not too many aircraft are flying at those low altitudes. That's why we're allowed to fly our models in the uncontrolled airspace. It is a reasonable separation from banned aircraft. Now, there are uh, programs within the FAA for drones to allow quicker permissions to fly in controlled airspace. One of those is the LANCE program, L-A-A-N-C. It's the Low Altitude Authorization and Notification Capability. 
The LANS program is in place with 726 airports as a database communication system, whereas an RC pilot, if you wish to fly in the controlled airspace of an airport nearby, you can get pretty quick confirmation whether or not you're allowed to do that, even though it's controlled airspace controlled by uh, the responsible airport for that. Other than that, we, we just have to be flying in uncontrolled airspace. So there's really no linkage between the requirement for remote ID, which is a security thing to identify aircraft flying in the national airspace system, and controlled, uncontrolled airspace, which is just kind of the fundamental duties of the um, FAA and air traffic control process. It's important to note this because the ultimate goal, as I've mentioned before, of commercial drone operators is fully integrated operations with manned and unmanned aircraft. That's going to take some pretty significant, significant technology jumps with see and avoid technology, because right now drones cannot see and avoid manned aircraft, and that's why they have to have segregated operations unless you're specifically um, allowed by things like Lance. Thank you for tuning in. That's where we are right now with Remote ID. Everything's uh, held off until March 16th, 2024. The vision of the FAA is everybody flying an RC model airplane has to have Remote ID standard or module. By March 16th, 2024, the only exception, recreational flyers in Afria, and there is no move afoot whatsoever for the FAA to expand FRIA status beyond the existing community-based organizations, which for most of us is the Academy of Model Aeronautics. Thank you very much.